Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our series on endodontics. So in this video, we're going to talk about endodontic diagnosis classifications, which are definitely important to know. Like all of my videos, I'm going to be focusing only on the highest yield topics. And while I'm gearing these videos for exam preparation, they're also designed to give you an overview for a clinical application and general knowledge. So again, in this video, we're going to be talking about the official diagnosis classifications from the American Association of Endodontists. And I'll leave a link in the description for the detailed PDF if you want to read through that later as sort of a reference. So every single tooth, whether dead or alive, has two endodontic diagnoses, has a pulpal diagnosis and a periapical diagnosis, sometimes just referred to as an apical diagnosis. So these are concerning the health of the pulp and the health of the tissues around the apex of the tooth, respectively. So we'll talk about the key points to know for each of these diagnoses, and we'll start with the pulpal ones. So for pulpal diagnosis, we have normal pulp, reversible pulpitis, symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis, pulp necrosis, and previously treated pulp. Previously treated meaning it has been or it is in the process of receiving some sort of treatment like a root canal therapy that has removed the natural pulp tissue. So let's first start with normal pulp. And a normal pulp is asymptomatic. And when we test it in a certain way, it has a mild to moderate transient response to thermal and electrical stimuli. So by transient, it means it subsides when the stimulus is removed and it's a momentary response. And when we see thermal and electrical, this means it's referring to the pulp. Those fibers in the pulp are stimulated with thermal and electrical stimuli. And these are conveniently tested with something called a cold test and an electric pulp test respectively, which we'll go on a quick tangent right now to cover these two most commonly used diagnostic tests for endodontic health and disease. So first, like I said, we have the cold test and a common chemical used is endo-ice, which is dichlorodifluoromethane and runs around negative 30 degrees Celsius. So it kind of looks like this, a, a bottle where you would spray onto a little piece of cotton and you have this chilled pellet in um, being held in say cotton pliers and it's applied immediately to the middle third of the facial surface of a crown for five seconds. And you want to make sure that tooth is thoroughly dried with a piece of cotton gauze or some equivalent and then apply the chilled pellet which you sprayed with this endo ice. Now the intensity and duration of the response provides the information that we want to know about the pulpal diagnosis. So that's how we would test, or one of the examples of testing, thermal stimulus applied to a tooth. And then the second most commonly used diagnostic tool is the electrical pulp test, or EPT for short. Now, just because it's convenient doesn't mean it's the most reliable. In fact, it's the least reliable pulp vitality testing method we have. So it indicates if there are vital sensory fibers, nervous tissue, present in the pulp, but does not provide any information about vascular supply to the pulp. And vascular supply to the pulp is actually the true determinant of pulp vitality, whether it's alive or dead. This is honestly true for the cold test as well, but at least the cold test provides a spectrum of information, whereas the EPT just tells you theoretically if the tooth is alive or dead, nothing in between. Now the EPT, as with the cold test, it can have these false positive and false negative results. Some examples of a false positive result would be if you touch the gingiva by accident, and the patient will certainly react to that, or the tooth is not isolated and dried properly. The example of a false negative would be a tooth that has been recently traumatized 
and the nervous tissue is not responsive, uh, and excessive calcification of a canal, whereas the, the pulp may not respond normally to an EPT, although the tooth is plenty vital. This test is also contraindicated if the patient has a cardiac pacemaker. So let's go back to our pulpal diagnoses, the second of which is reversible pulpitis. Now in contrast to a normal pulp, this one is symptomatic. So the thermal, usually cold stimulus, causes quick, sharp, hypersensitive transient response. So this is different. The thermal response is heightened as opposed to normal pulp, which is just mild to moderate. So calling back from our previous video, this is an example of hyperalgesia, where a normal situation hurts a little bit, and the inflamed situation hurts a lot more. This is why you always test several teeth, not just the one that you're concerned about, so you have a baseline response to compare it to. So you test adjacent teeth, test opposing teeth, test contralateral teeth, etc. The patient will not have complaints of spontaneous pain, that is pain that just happens out of nowhere, can wake them up from sleep. And so reversible pulpitis is caused by an irritant that affects the pulp. So irritants can be caries, it can be um, a deep cleaning, it can be deep restorations without a proper liner and or base. Um, there are a bunch of different examples of irritants, but if the irritant is removed, the pulp reverts to an uninflamed state, hence why it's called reversible. So it's not irreversible damage. The irritant that is bothering the pulp is removed. It can actually revert to a normal pulp status. If the irritant remains, however, the symptoms may lead to irreversible pulpitis, which is the next stage we'll talk about. And so frank penetration of bacteria into the pulp frequently is the crossover point to irreversible pulpitis. And just note that this is technically a symptom, not a disease. So next we have symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. Microscopically, the pulp has these little micro abscesses, pockets of, inf of inflammation and infection, and intact nerves at the same time. So this is going to be very, very painful and certainly symptomatic. So again, this is where the pulp has been irreversibly damaged beyond repair. And even with removal of the irritant, it will not fully heal. It's characterized by spontaneous intermittent or continuous pain. So this means that spontaneous, it means it's unprovoked. It just happens seemingly without any stimulus there and it can wake the patient up from sleep. So again, the thermal, often cold stimulus, using going back to that cold test, causes not only a heightened response, but lingering pain. So if the stimulus is removed, you apply that chilled pellet, the patient raises their hand, they're in pain, and you remove that pellet, they still remain in pain maybe for 10, 15, even 20 seconds after removing that chilled pellet. So it lingers for quite a long time. And that's a key fact in determining that this pulp is irreversibly damaged. Postural changes like bending over or lying down increases blood pressure to the head and may exacerbate the dental pain. Radiographs are generally insufficient, and EPT is of little value for diagnosis. So we're really relying a lot on the patient history, their explanation of their dental pain, and the cold test results. Next we have this kind of strange one, asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis. So the patient is actually asymptomatic. And I want to clarify, asymptomatic doesn't mean that it's numb and the patient feels nothing. It just means that nerves are responding rather normally. And the pulp um, is basically almost like a normal pulp in terms of response, but microscopically, histologically, and physiologically, the pulp has been irreversibly damaged and requires some form of treatment. And it can be difficult 
to treat in the fact in the reasoning that a patient may feel like nothing's wrong, but actually there is irreversible damage in this case. So again, it's microscopically similar to the previous stage being symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, but there are no clinical symptoms. And last we have pulp necrosis. And it's usually asymptomatic, but not always. So pulp necrosis is basically death of the pulp tissue, and it may occur quickly or require years and years. This process may be painful, but more frequently it is asymptomatic. It can be partial or total necrosis, so it can affect only a portion of a tooth's pulp or the entire uh, entirety of the pulp. Um, it's often due to long-term interruption of blood supply to the pulp, and crown discoloration may accompany pulp necrosis, particularly in anterior teeth. So pulp necrosis discoloring teeth can be treated with a root canal therapy and this thing called internal bleaching, which is something that I've talked about at length in my internal bleaching video. And feel free to check that out if you're interested in how this treatment works. It's actually pretty cool. So to review, for pulpal diagnosis, it's best to think about it like a spectrum. The cold test is the best method, and the EPT only tells you if it's vital or not, nothing in between. So with the cold test, normal pulp is a normal response and non-lingering response. Reversible pulpitis is a heightened response and non-lingering. Symptomatic irreversible pulpitis is a heightened response and a lingering response. Asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis is a normal response and non-lingering, similar to normal pulp. And pulp necrosis is the only one where you feel nothing at all, so no response to the cold test. Now, if a necrotic pulp is left untreated, toxins eventually spread beyond the apical foramen and leads to thickening of the periodontal ligament, tenderness to percussion and palpation, and apical disease. So let's talk about those diagnoses next. So apical lesions of pulpal origin are inflammatory responses to irritants from the root canal system, basically extension of pulpal disease into the apical tissue. Of interest to note, there are other causes of apical lesions, including occlusal trauma, canal over-instrumentation, and periodontal lesions. So for periapical diagnoses, we have normal apical tissues, symptomatic apical periodontitis, asymptomatic apical periodontitis, acute apical abscess, and chronic apical abscess. So like we did with pulpal, let's start with the normal one first. So normal apical tissues are asymptomatic and there's no pain on percussion and palpation. So what do I mean by this? Well, whereas cold test and EPT were our two main diagnostic tools for pulpal diagnosis, percussion and palpation and x-rays, are our main diagnostic tools for apical diagnosis. So let's again go on a quick tangent and talk about those. So percussion involves tapping on teeth, often with a mirror handle, pretty easy to do so. So you tap in a vertical direction along the long axis of the tooth and see how the patient responds. Usually feel the tapping, the vibration, but shouldn't be painful with a normal response. Palpation is feeling with a gloved finger on the gum tissue around the apex of the root of that tooth, so up in the vestibular area. And again, they should feel you palpating that region, but they shouldn't feel anything overly painful, and you shouldn't feel anything that feels unusually swollen or fluctuant. So if we go back to our diagnoses, the second one was symptomatic apical periodontitis. So this involves painful inflammation around the apex. It's characterized 
by painful percussion and intense throbbing pain. And this is due to this localized inflammatory infiltrate within the periodontal ligament. Now, if a tooth is vital and has this symptomatic apical periodontitis, simple occlusal adjustment often relieves pain. Maybe this tooth is high in occlusion, it's hitting before the other teeth, and you simply have to shave a little bit of that tooth structure off so that the, occlu the occlusal contact is not quite so heavy and not overloading that periodontal ligament. Now, if the tooth is necrotic, endodontic therapy is necessary to prevent disease progression. And that's figuring that this apical infection was born out of an infection that started in the pulp and spread through the foramen to the apical tissues. So next we have asymptomatic apical periodontitis. And as the name implies, this one's asymptomatic. It involves this apical radiolucency. This is where x-rays really come in handy, and it's a confirmation of pulpal necrosis. Now, a totally necrotic pulp provides a safe harbor for the primarily anaerobic bacteria that leak out into this PDL space. A periapical radiolucency can be a radicular cyst or a periapical granuloma, depending on the exact histology. But the more important thing is that there is this radiographically evident radiolucency at the apex. So that's a key sign to determining this diagnosis. Next we have acute apical abscess. This one involves rapid swelling, severe pain, and purulent exudate, exudate which is uh, basically pus, liquefaction necrosis, around the apex. So this one has very unique cardinal features. So acute apical abscess is pretty easy to diagnose because these things are present. And lastly, we have chronic apical abscess. So this one is different from the acute apical abscess in a couple key ways, and it involves this draining sinus tract, usually without discomfort and usually without swelling because it has a draining sinus tract. So what does that look like? Well, here's an example of what appears to be a kind of smaller abscess, not quite so much swelling, and there's actually this tract that goes between that communicates with the oral cavity and a source of infection associated with one of these teeth. Now sometimes, like in this picture, you can actually insert a gutta percha cone through the sinus tract, stop when you feel resistance, and then with it in place, expose a periapical radiograph and find the path and source of the sinus tract. And sometimes it may surprise you which tooth is actually the source. So in this example, you could trace it to this premolar here. But it could be surprising because it looks like it's at the apex of that tooth, and maybe the cone goes through here and bends back to go to this molar or something, for, for instance. So this is a really great diagnostic tool for uh, figuring out the source and origin of a chronic apical abscess. So to review these ones, periapical diagnoses are an algorithm. Each of these has one key characteristic that helps differentiate it from the rest. So acute apical abscess is at the top. It's basically the king of apical disease, so to speak, because it has swelling and lots of pain, and that differentiates it from all the rest. Now, if you have no swelling and less pain, you might have a chronic apical abscess, which has a draining sinus tract, and that's the key feature there. Now, what if you have no sinus tract? Well, symptomatic apical periodontitis has pain on percussion, and that's the key feature there. Now, what if you have no pain? Well, the asymptomatic apical periodontitis 
has an apical radiolucency. So that's the key feature there. And what if it has none of those key features? Well, then it's a normal, normal apical tissue. All right, and that's it for this video. I hope you found it helpful, and thank you so much for watching, everyone. I will see you all in the next video.